just before this session starts, I would very much like to say a huge thank you to the sponsors, which are JBT, Cinepower, Aviarco GSE, Textron, and DVD Communications. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are back again on the GSE and Ramp Digital event. So it's lovely to uh, be back with you again and got three guests now. Um, so we've moved up from two to three. So um, hopefully we're going to have three times the value, three times the entertainment and three times the learning knowledge. So welcome Paul Holmes, welcome Steve Cannon and welcome John Edmonds. Hi. Hi. Oh. Hi. Thanks, guys. That was uh, that, that was energetic. We won't, we won't do a rehearsal. I'm sure it'll get better as we move on. Now, we've got Paul Holmes, who's Managing Director of Smart Asset, Asset Manager, based in the UK. We've got Steve Cannon, who's the Head of Global Fleet Management, Swiss Port, and based in Switzerland. And we've got John Edmonds, who's the Head of Fleet Western Europe, uh, based in the UK. I think that's right, isn't it? John, you're based in the UK. I am indeed, yeah. That's right, yeah. Yep. All right, guys. So, lovely to have you on. Now, how we normally start is we get each of you just to give us a little bit of background as to your specific responsibilities, accountabilities in your position at the moment. So um, we may as well start with you, John. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name's John Edmonds, I've been introduced, uh, Head of Fleet Western Europe. I used to sit in the seat in Europe doing a similar role, uh, but when the uh, positions merged, uh, I came over to UK. I'm responsible for all the fleet and GSC maintenance workshops, management, uh, governance thereof, of all our GSC assets within Western Europe, and apply in that transformation business that Steve portrays as policy and procedures from global. I take it, form the strategy and implement it in the UK uh, across our, across our uh, a GSC fleet primarily, uh, and also now monitoring our third party outsource maintenance contractors and indeed feeding back to Steve on um, such things as equipment specifications, equipment liability and all that, all that good stuff that goes together to, uh, to help form strategy going forward. All right. Thank you very much, John. And it would be, I think, the right way if we go now with you, Steve, please. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and uh, uh, hello to everybody uh, who listens to the podcast. Uh, my name is Steve Cannon. Um, I am uh, the head of fleet uh, management for for Global. Um, I have two combined roles currently at the moment. Um, um, uh, as of first of October last year, I was head of fleet uh, EMEA, um, and then we've uh, combined the roles of head of fleet EMEA uh, to, with uh, head of fleet Global. Um, I, I I report directly to uh, EVP um, EMEA. Uh, but I also have a reporting line to SVP Global Ops. And my responsibilities uh, range from um, uh, the, the purest sense of fleet management, you know, S uh, enterprise asset management, through to uh, transformation, TCO, TCM, uh, digitization, you know, the full spectrum of through life capability management. Very good. At this point, I've got to say, and I did say earlier when we were introduced, I've got to admire your uh, fashion sense. Not very often I get somebody on who's got almost the exact same shirt as me. So wonderful choice, my friend. Looks good. Thank you, Chris. And and now if we can come to Paul. Hi, Chris, and hi everybody out there. Um, my name is Paul Holmes, and the managing director of Smart Asset Management. Um, I've been involved in telematics for about four or five years now, and and during that period, as a business, we took a a positive step to look at aviation as a sector and we've specialized our solutions in and around airports um, so we've been relatively successful and um, we now operate in the uk uh, western europe and scandinavia and, and we're looking to take that a little bit further from a single platform okay very very good now if i may paul and just for the just for <laughs> clarification and for everybody else do you want to just give a quick explanation of what telematics is Yep. Yeah, that's, that's not a problem at all. So telematics is the provision of data relating to an asset or vehicle that's transponded by a GSM or bar phone sort of system via, via the networks. And from this, you can tell where a vehicle or an asset is, where it's been, how it's been used, what it's been up to, and everything. I can give you as much data from that vehicle or asset as you can wish for. And therein lies a quite an interesting tale that I'm sure we'll pick up later in the presentation. Yeah, no, I'm sure we, I'm sure we will. 
now, um, Steve and John, you've got um, you've got your own fleet transformation uh, transformation plan and journey project program, however you want to call it, in place. Now, with the current pressures as a result, especially now of the crisis, an emphasis on how we all in the industry use our money, cash flow, assets, what do we do, etc., how to get the most efficiencies out of them. What's been the biggest impacts or the biggest learnings that you both have experienced now as a result of the crisis? Is that so? If you mind, if I go first, Chris, Steve? No, no. no okay, sir. okay. So, um, okay, so, so I think uh, one of the biggest learnings, and I'm going to slightly digress um, just for a second. One of the biggest learnings I think we've definitely identified in Swissport, and it's not just fleet, is um, is is the I would say the improvements in effective communications using platforms such as Teams, um, like we're now currently on Zoom. And uh, we've been able to reach out to a far wider audience and manage many of our projects, manage of our issues and you know, our communication, I think, far more effectively. And I think we've reduced an awful lot of time of, uh, through reducing the number of meetings. We've increased time through, through, through reduction in, in various meetings we had before. So I think, I think we've managed to, to, to and we definitely identified this through some workshops that we've been doing in Swissport. Um, we, we, ran a, we, we ran a workshop a, a few months ago and it's called VUCA. Now VUCA is a military term. I'm ex-military for 36 years before I joined Swissport. And VUCA is, is, is looking, at, uh, looking at a scenario like COVID-19 and looking at uh, an operating in a vulnerable and certain com complex and ambiguous um, environment. And, and I think, uh, you know, we took it as a, as, a, as, as, a, as a direction of travel to understand what that meant and learn some lessons from that. And, and and, and look at you know how we operate uh, as a business, how we operate um, at a region, how we operate at stations, how we operate in, down down at the, at the ramp. And you alluded to, alluded to that in, in the beginning. So I think that's one of the very first very very positive learnings. I think the second positive learning that we we've definitely taken away is how we've managed to collaborate uh, yeah. and be far more positive. We've been very very positive throughout this. COVID-19, um, uh, uh, you know, um, crisis. Uh, and, and we definitely recognize that. And I'm not just saying that for the sake of this podcast. We, we've definitely recognized that sense of positivity, that sense of trying to help each other, even stepping out of our comfort lanes. And, you know, for instance, when the crisis first started, I offered to, my services to help with some of the crisis management within EMEA when I was head of fleet EMEA because of my background. And I was stepping into an area where I didn't necessarily fully understand the absolute operation of an airport, but yeah. I understood crisis management and, and, and applied some of the principles I learned in a previous life. And, and John has done exactly the same as of many others. So that's the second positive step. I think the third positive step for fleet is absolutely highlighted the requirement for accurate GSC planning. Yeah. That, that you know, we are seeing, uh, you know, as we all are, um, significant downturns in volumes. Um, we are obviously now seeing significant numbers of GSC that are parked up in various states around yeah. the globe. Uh, and I think it is highlighted. And in fact, I am briefing my EVP tomorrow uh, on the criticality of effective GSC planning and the, and the criticality of making decisions of what to do with surplus equipment, you know, whether you're going to dispose of it, whether you're going to sell it, transfer it, you know, before you place a purchase order for new equipment, let's have a look what we have that's surplus. Uh, and I think, um, that is probably, you know, is going to be one of the most positive messages or learnings from pure fleet perspective that we could take forward. Linked to, which we'll talk about in a bit, you know, what we do in terms of digitization data, because part of that surplus at fleet is understanding the utility of that fleet. So I think there's been some really positive outcomes from, from, from this in that perspective, Chris. Okay, good, good. Thank you for that. And John, and John, just um, just moving on from that now, as far as can I just add to that, Chris? Can I just add to that a little bit as well? You, you can indeed. You can indeed. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm for me, I think you know, the, John. Sorry, I was just going to ask, what yeah, I was going to ask you to, to to also consider is you know with all of the equipment now that's a, that's lying around and people are seeing it, etc. Obviously, you know if you're going to you, you've got to make a decision whether or not it's going to be mothballed or whether you're going to bring it back as and when suddenly there's a surge and we've had a couple of surges and I'm pretty sure there'll be another one in about five or six months when everybody decides that they need to travel, etc. Um, have you seen have you seen a problem or have you seen something that's been addressed with all of the staff to make sure that um, 
you know, they're all retrained or, or spot trained or confirmed that they're capable when they come back. Because like any of us, if we're away on a holiday for two or three or four weeks, even when you get back and you get into your own car, it feels different. Yeah, that's very true. Just just to pick up on a couple of points that, that Steve raised there. And I think I think one of the things for me that's that's come out of being <clears throat> of, of this crisis is the agility of the business and the agility yep. of the people around us. You know, I, I remember very early on when COVID hit, you know, I was making plans and strategy and an hour later they were defunct and irrelevant and I had to go back and revisit them. So I, I think the agility around where we've had, what we've had to do and where we've come from, which where I was going to lead into your point here about what did we actually do for equipment? I would challenge anybody before this COVID hit, nobody ever thought of surface, nobody ever really thought of out of use, nobody really thought of mothball what that actually meant so you know S S steve and i sort of had a chat very early on in the, in the in the covid crisis and we both recognized early on that actually we we'd done some very good transformation pieces on policies procedures maintenance schedules and all that and we both looked at each other and went we don't have an out of use policy yeah you know, what does that mean what does out of use mean um yeah. So it's it, it really gave us focus and I think the agility to pick up on your point. Uh, yes, I do agree that there's an element of um, risk around people not having touched equipment. But there again, in the same way as you ride a bicycle, people, people uh, uh, become very familiar very quickly. But the way we've addressed it is that we, you know, as part of our policy, we reintroduce them with, it, with a, some sort of small training, refresher training model. It might not be going into the same depth as they did yeah. like initial training, but as you, 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 if I was to give you an example of when you pick up a new car, the salesman, salesman very often goes, the indicators are on the right, the headlights are on the left, this is the brake, this is the clutch, that's how you start it. It's that sort of refresher that actually, if you touch on those elements of, of importance, the rest kind of kicks in afterwards. Um, with the with the oh yeah I remember now because it you know it becomes it's it's been a you've been doing it for a long time so that that's the way we've addressed it um, uh, and we do we do you know really focus on the fact that we rotate our fleets you know you as, to pick up on a, other points most GSC handlers out there will have a multitude of models just in one type of variant of GSC so we've tried to you know we've yeah, tried yeah. to we've tried to streamline for the same model so it so we're not having to refresh on one type of manufacturer against another type of manufacturer in that model that model process so that's how that's how we've addressed it and that's how we've attacked this uh and uh it, touch wood it's been you know feedback from the operation has been very positive in that respect yeah no no it's so important so important Thanks very much for that, John. Now, coming back to you, Paul, and looking at the issue of, you know, whether or not there's too much GSE at the moment and mm. whether it's going to be one year, two years, three years, who knows, <laughs> until the, you know, consumer confidence comes back, vaccines, etc. So with the information and the data that you're able to provide, you're able to give a good overview of the usage of the specific equipment, how it rotates with its preventive maintenance, the location of it on the airport, on the ramp, etc., you're able to provide all of that information, which then provides the parties who own the equipment with a fair insight into what they do in the future, correct? Absolutely. And, and what I'm going to do is draw an example of what we were doing, which is quite ironic, just prior to lockdown, um, back in sort of January, February, working with one of our customers for about a year, analysing yeah. data of uh, asset utilisation, and through a series of challenge and review with the operation, because operation always said, we haven't got enough kit. We need more kit. We need to yeah. have that extra bit of kit. And it was always a challenge. We were the independent party in this, you know, because if you think about it, if I have less GSE, less equipment, I make less money. So right. I'm, I've I got this right, but I want to get more customers. So we had this ongoing debate where it was challenging review. And at the end of this, by saying, right, these are the assets, this is your workload and matching it down to the minute okay we took out a quite a large percentage of the fleet three four five weeks before lockdown that then got overtaken by lockdown but what it did and going back to what you were saying with steve earlier about the learnings is prior to lockdown 
every penny counted. In the new world, whatever that looks like, it will be every penny counts plus. Yep. It's absolutely paramount that the the operators, the the GSE operators, the Swiss sports of this world alike, actually know what they need and don't have they don't they can't have too much and they don't need too little. It's just getting that sweet spot. And the only way you can do that is collaboration between the operators using the data and the airlines to get the right balance. And it's all about balance. Within that is the ability to flex. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we've also looked at is, okay, you need X percent of utilization, but every day, every month, they've got an additional lot of work coming in or a downturn. What can you do very quickly to compensate or address that? So by doing some quite clever um, activities on the telematic systems, we go, so we've got these positions, so right, there's your fix, here's a bit of flex. And they're the sort of things that we've, re- and I think going into the new world, whenever that might be, six months, nine months, a year, the likes of Steve and John and all their friends out there will really need to get their finger. They're not saying they're not doing it now, but it's got to be tighter than it ever has yeah. been. Because... Yeah there's got to be money recovered people have lost a heck of a lot of money over these last nine months and and going on that needs to be recovered and careful management of assets is key chris chris can i just add something to what paul's saying there from a swiss port perspective that underpins what he's saying if i may is that the critical part of our transformation journey in fleet as we started three three and a half years ago coming from outside coming into the industry it absolutely hit me hard that there was very little um, effective policy written for an awful lot of things that we do. Okay, yes, we've got the AHM, but that's guidance. But but at a at a at a at a at, a, at the coal face level, is there clear direction about how we should do things? Planning is one of those key things. So we, we have a we have a uh, an SMP, you know, management policy document within Swissport resource planning. Uh, and it's 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 uh, it it goes into very great detail about how you plan using GS planning for your resource based on engagement standards, and that's the first lesson, another lesson identified, you know, key engagement standards, accurate engagement standards, standards, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the operation are very very important. And then when we get into the GSC space, we we are we've driven into this hard uh, within Swissport in the last few months. The planning community now see Fleet as a customer. They've actually said you are a customer of the planning community, which is really key. And John's done some great work this in Western Europe. So we are looking in Fleet for the planners to do that uh, you know, effective, uh, accurate, and 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 well scrutinised um, planning, so that when GS planning gives gives some numbers. Uh, and it gives numbers and assuming all your engagement standards and all your other parameters are set correctly, what tends to happen very often is a ramp will say, yes, but I need five more plus two for maintenance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very often that is accepted. Um, and what we are saying in terms of uh, revamping the process and procedures is that needs to be given the same level of scrutiny as you do for human resource. And yeah. we, and I'm not for one moment saying the operation have got it are wrong or, you know what well, because very often there's a there's a justifiable reason yeah you've got remote stands or whatever but what we're saying is justify it justify it from an operational and a financial perspective is why you think you know, particularly if you're leasing those, those seven additional I'm saying if you're leasing them that's a high cost if you own them it's a high cost and this is what you're saying about the the brave new world coming forward that kind of um uh, standard behavior needs to be needs to be challenged uh, and uh, you know and then we can we can we can get those facts right the bit that john touched on about out of use equipment surplus equipment now this is going back to our military days where we used to store equipment you know, for, <coughs> you, know you know very complex equipment um, you know in readiness uh, re- different levels of readiness and we'd have different fleets training fleets and operation fleets and that's when it first started john and i had a conversation and said what do we what's the policy for out of use equipment what do we mean by out of use what do you do when it's out of use what kind of level of maintenance do you conduct because there is a there is a misbelief i believe in many parts of um, of, of of many industries that if you put something out of use you just park it up and forget about it at nil cost well actually in my experience the military sometimes the maintenance was more intensive when it was out of use to, to be able to you know exercise various parts of the, of, of the vehicle if it was out for a long time. But we've written some very clear policies which have gone live in the business, an out of use policy, and we've just literally completed a surplus management policy. So 
John's a prime example. John will look at his fleet with the planners. They'll identify their, their, their forecast, which is quite difficult at the moment. You know, trying to determine your forecast going forward of any degree of accuracy is very difficult. So you have to make some assumptions. Once you've identified your surplus fleet, fleet we've time bound it. And then it should move from, uh, sorry, from out of use. It should move from out of use into surplus. And then from surplus, you need to make some decisions within a, within a given time frame. Am I going to dispose of it? Am I going to sell it? Am I going to, am I going to scrap it? Am I going to transfer it? And it's bringing that professional view to that and getting all the station managers to understand that because that intrinsically drives your P&L and, 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 your, and your cost. So for us in Swissport, the policy is key. Um, and, and then the policy will then filter down through the management chain. And then you know, it was like so John will then implement that from an operational perspective in the regions. Uh, that's, that, yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And obviously business continuity and sustainability is so, so important now. And it's an area that is being looked at more than ever before. And I remember obviously pre-COVID, you know, you, you talk to people, especially in the QHS, s &E environment, and they'd be, they'd be frustrated because they weren't being... You know, they weren't being included. They weren't being spoken to. And now with risk, and you look at what everybody's done since COVID, they're a lot more a lot more aware now of risk and business continuity and sustainability, importance of cash flow. I mean, it's been an incredible lesson, a lesson that nobody would have ever understood. Now, with so much change, let me ask, ask you, gentlemen, and with so much surplus equipment everywhere, um, do you think now is the time or do you think there's an opportunity for airports to start to provide or to be more influential in a, in a centralised pooling system? I'll let, I'll, 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 let, I'll, let John, I'll let John take this one. Yeah, there you From go, John. Perspective. Yeah, I mean, but there, there's definitely an element um, where pooling has its benefits and it's an obvious obvious role uh, obvious obvious remit to look at and i would suggest there are a number of handlers around the patch as you suggested where we have things that are stationary or surplus you know luton is probably an example of pooling where it definitely has has you know been a been a, 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 a relatively successful yeah. enterprise in terms of in terms of what it's doing and how it's being run I would I would certainly suggest one of the key key factors is telemetry within pooling, um, so we can understand what we what we have, where it is, what we need, and and how do we best utilise that. Um, but I also think I, I for me, I think it's for us to take it to the airport rather than the airport bring it to me. Um, we are the subject matter experts in ground handling in terms of handlers. And we need to engage with the airport to, to ask them and work with them about how and what pooling means. Yep. And, and that means that we get a product that's delivered that works for us rather than being told that we have to use a product. Mm -hmm. If you if you kind of so I, I think we need to I need to think we need to reach out to airports and talk to them and uh, and go and look at a joint venture in terms of uh, a pooling pooling initiative so where you made the point of is it times for airports to take the lead i think it's ground handlers that need to take the lead uh, and come up with the solutions of, of what's going to work for us in in that in that terms i think and i think if i can just echo on that one yeah. is that methodology is the exact same methodology we used in the development of our systems because we came from a fleet system yeah and we talked to handlers on a regular basis and got them involved in the development and deployment of our system. And the next logical step is in without without telematics in pool, and it's going to be now impossible to run it from a, yeah. from a safety point of view, from a billing perspective, from a utilization perspective, whatever you look at it. So we would be more than willing to join forces with anybody to say, to go to the airports and let's build something that worked rather than being, as John says, it's just something dropped into you and, and it try and shoe on that in. Yeah. Let's build something that is actually feasible. Right? And, there's, and there's still some complexities around uh, liabilities yeah. and, and training for complex equipment and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, uh, you know, and who, who bears the cost of damage to GSE, but that, that none of that is insurmountable, but there are challenges. And exactly. I think, uh, I think uh, I'm looking at Paul here. I think um, I've had many, many, many um, station managers and regional managers um, uh, and even uh, senior executives have been talking to me about, um, uh, about utility of equipment, 
currently utility of equipment against the plan we spoke about planning earlier and uh, we need to understand this Steve we really need to understand the, the, the you know the cost per weight return uh, you know, are we actually using the asset uh, to its to, you know to its to its maximum what I'd call sweating the asset and of course my answer is is telematics because short of telematics you need you, the only thing you've got is a man or a, or a woman with a clipboard and a pencil yeah. going around tracking everything that's going on which is just not cost effective or, or even an effective way of doing it so you know you need to put sensors on the platform so we can understand it because where we are doing that and where you do see that and where we've been doing some proof of concepts you suddenly realize in some cases it's a, it's, it's 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 you know it, it is viable it's justifiable but you, you'll see some assets they've only moved 20 minutes in the day yeah and then you'll yeah. see some assets are being used for whatever reason, going from one part of the airport to another part of the airport, um, and then back across to lunch, you know, you're talking an ATL or an ATC, you know, expensive equipment is going, doing a, you know, an amazing amount of hours, and it actually, actually hasn't touched an aircraft. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and but we can't see that. You can you you get anecdotal evidence, but it's the objective evidence you require. So that's the criticality of of moving to the telematics era. But of course, the criticality of this, and we discussed this before with Paul on, on a warm up, is is it's, it's that return on investment. So it's investing up front, however way you do that, and demonstrating, actually demonstrating, you're going to get a return on investment uh, and, and and realizing that investment through effective decision making. And there's the challenge, I think, Paul, is it, is it not? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And we've got numerous techniques within the uh, telemetry um, armory to deal with certain, certain circumstances. For example, we can we can geofence a specific part of the airport and we can see vehicles going in and out of that airport uh, part of the airport all through the day and they're not actually supposed to be there mm. you know and we've got examples where we've set up places outside um smoking areas and you see the traffic yeah. around that these are classics you know and we soon as we put that in we we issue the results you get a change in behavior okay so something very simple can be very, very quick turnaround, okay? And it was all of those little minute elements that we did with this big piece of work last year. And we grouped all that together and said, if you take this little small element here, this little small element here, and this small, it actually starts to add up to something quite significant. And do you need 10 of those? I mean, the, the numbers say you actually only need seven, mm. okay? Goodbye to three of them, you know? And it's that sort of, so there's techniques we can do with geofencing. One of the things that, you know, we've done is linking the telematics to the qualifications of the driver of that piece of equipment. So with their, their blue badge, wherever it is, their card, their ID card, they can only drive assets they're trained to drive. And if they are not authorized, it will not start. Okay, there's overrides for safety and all that sort of good stuff. But it also sends a message to the manager that so Paul's not trained to drive that belt loader. So Paul goes along and tries to start the belt loader. It doesn't start. My manager gets a note, has a word with me, what were you trying to do? Okay, that behavior, overnight change, overnight. I'll ask you something. If you had the qualification and I didn't, but I borrowed your card, how, how does that get overcome? That. Can I answer that one? Yeah, go on, John. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, the, from my experience and having implemented this in, a, in my previous life, in my previous company, I was very insistent that you actually use the airport pass. I'm assuming that you use the same, Paul. Absolutely. And therefore, I, am, I need that to get in and out of the airport. That is accountable for my driving ADP permit. So I'm very unlikely to lend you my pass. And the reason that I swapped, actually, when I first worked at my first company, uh, which was Donata, we did have a telemetry system. We were one of the, one of the first to have installed it. It had been there for about five or six years. Yeah. Um, and it was done on like a FOB basis. So you had like a, a, an RFID FOB. Everybody was issued one. You touched it on the equipment. It would then operate. And that that was open to abuse, as you've suggested. Oh, God, you, you know, Paul, I've, I forgot me fob, lend me yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, but you won't lend me your airside pass because you intrinsically need it to operate and work on the airport. And any violations of that pass, you're getting it, not Paul. So yeah. there is there are ways around that. So we actually went down and, and, and in Swissport, we've, we've gone down the same route where the airside pass 
uh, which is RFID'd in most cases or in you know 99.9% .9 cases because you most people will swipe it to get out for example yeah. um, you use the same RFID chip to to activate the equipment on, and say that you are trained and able to operate it so that's how that's how we and I'm assuming Paul you do the same absolutely we we went down a similar route when when we first arrived it was a as you say, a Bob sort of a Dallas key type arrangement, the same equipment that you use in a pub. So when you see people working the tills, mm -hmm. yeah. so the little discs, uh, clearly they were getting passed around because we were resupplying these every week in their tens, hundreds, because people just threw them away, lost them, get me another one, get me another one. They had no value. Whereas John says, linking it to the ID card that gets you in and out to work, well, you're not going to pass that around because one, it's got your photograph on there, and two, if you don't use it and you lose, you can't get to work the following day. Exactly. Very coming rare. Back to, coming back to some, something that you said earlier, John, about uh, when I was talking about the airport and about the GHAs <laughs> driving it. Um, I agree with that. And I agree with the fact that, um, you know, it's feet on ground and logical common sense that is always necessary in every single plan, which unfortunately in the past was forgotten because it was taken above people that were actually doing it. I've done, I've done podcasts with IT platforms where they focus on super users in, instead of the end user and, you know, it all gets started. So I, I totally agree with that. I, I just think now is the time that airports encourage, which is probably what I should have said, they encourage a different approach from the community that they actually represent. Because at the end of the day, airlines can fly in, they can fly out and they can fly off. But airports and GHAs need to stay together and, and support that community to make it as attractive as, as possible for when business does come in and, and, and is competing with other areas. So yeah, yeah, I, agree I agree that the logical, the logical approach has to be done. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think for each individual airport, it's different. You know, um, whilst in Western Europe, I went over to Brussels and I spoke to them around the aspiration for them to go pooling. And one of my first questions when I did the presentation was, OK, what does pooling mean to you? Yeah. Of which there was a deathly silence. You know, so it, you, you, I think one of the first aspects of any any pooling project is to what do you actually mean by pooling? And it's one of those questions where you thrash it out. In Skiphole, it, pooling means it, it means assets in a pool of ASUs, GPUs that you go and fetch and you use. In, in Luton, it means head of stand equipment. Yep. So it, there are there are variations on what pooling actually means and that's why i mean that's why i think it, it it's it's it needs a joint venture and we we need to because of every every airport infrastructure is, is different as, as yeah. i'm sure you're aware i don't have to tell people to suck eggs on that one everything's different so it needs to de work in a different way and that's where i think we need to be intrinsically involved and be as you say encouraged by the airport to work together to find what the solution is for that particular airport and also with regards to data justification tracking is so important with data, otherwise you misread it or it's not the story that you expect. And there's differences with distances from ramp, et cetera, that make everything different in every single airport, I totally agree. But if there was more transparency of that justification tracking so people could understand, I think it would make a lot of decisions a lot, a lot more effective. Yeah, and Chris, we, we, we've been embarking on our telematics um, program now, um, probably, probably 18 months uh, in reality. And um, uh, uh, and you made a very important point, and I take this back from my previous life, you know, when I used to work on the ground many, many years ago, you know, when I was in the military, is that I always like, I always, always, always say to people, not only do we need to look for our lens as managers, we need to look through the lenses of the operators yeah. and, uh, and the managers on the ramp. You know, what is their daily life? What, what challenges do they have? What, what do we need to do to make their life uh, more effective uh, and easier to, 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 for them to operate. And one of the classics we've had is, um, we, you know, we've got a telematic solution uh, and part of the de development of that tele telematic solution is to develop some SOPs. How do you use telematics? So you've got a number of feeds, a number of uh, signals, all sorts of reports, all sorts of data on a screen. And when I first started this, this discussion, because obviously because of my background, SOPs was always you know, sacramount, okay? And, and I say, so we need to develop some SOPs. Okay, Steve, develop them. But I see it at a global level. I yeah. can give you a nice global view. Thou must use the feed from something like utility and make a decision on the size of your fleet. But the real 
effort is down at the station level. Let's call it LOPs and yeah. getting the operators on the ground with, their, with their, their line management on the ground to fully understand what it is you get out of this system or systems. And so when a signal or a feed goes to, let's say, the fleet manager in one of, the, in one of our stations, first of all, that fleet manager needs to know it's coming. And secondly, he needs to understand what he or she is seeing. And then thirdly, what do I need to do with it? And it's the same at all levels. And that was a challenge initially. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what you hear very often from very, very senior people. We've been here before. What's different this time? And what needs to be different this time is, is, is developing those operational procedures. And I'm sure Paul will talk about that because you've got to operationalize the outputs of telematics. So then at the various right levels of management, you can make those timely, effective decisions, which will reduce the fleet or make better utility of the fleet or smart maintenance, for example. You know, we haven't mentioned that. Let's break away from I must do a, you know, a, an ABCD check. Let's maintain equipment when I require to maintain equipment based on data, you know, and yeah. reduce the servicing costs and, 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 and TCO, TCM. So, and I think Paul and I have already discussed this. I think this is the criti critical piece of this, this capability, isn't it, Paul? For me, it's it's all about buy-in at, at various levels. You know, when I first arrived, um, I'm not saying it's just me, but when I first arrived, it was telematics from various suppliers were just presented into the operations and just get on with it. Yeah. And you got a definite sort of negative reaction from the users. I'm being spied upon. Why do they want this data? What what are they looking for? Are they trying to catch me out? Whereas we adopted approach three four years ago where we actually spent hours and hours and hours in workshops with the operators to say, right, if you had this technology, what would you want from it? How would you want it to look? And what are you trying to achieve? And from that, we started to build an airport version and then presented that back saying, is this exactly what you want? No, it's not. It's 80% there. Okay, let's, ref and we've been refining and we're still doing it today. You know, yeah. we're not there yet. We're refining as we go, but it's all about that buy-in. So you've got the buy-in at the operational ground level from the users. And then as Steve has alluded to, from a managerial point of view, you know, what data do you want from the system? What do you want it to tell you? And how do you want it to be presented? Because if you think about it, if you take Heathrow, how many assets at Heathrow at any one time? Thousands and thousands. How many pulses of data are being fired out from telematics every day? Millions. Now, I could present you all that information in a, in a big spreadsheet or on a stick or whatever. It's absolutely meaningless. Yeah. However, what do I want to know? How does it stack up against all of my other assets? Is there one asset that's performing badly or very well? Is there a driver that's performing well or a bit out of the averages? And from that, you can then start to league table and drill down on performance. So it's all there, but the skill is actually extracting that data in the right format to make it manageable. But then the next trick is, and I think Steve mentioned this earlier, we present it in this nice little package and we put a bow around it and present it and it's there it is. And nobody opens it and nobody reads it. Yeah. You know, that is where we're going next is where is we were, we're going to present and we're also going to make sure there's a follow-up action on that presentation. Yeah. So, and again, we're looking at various methods of how this is, is adopted. You know, what I've seen, and I'm, I'm, I'm the new boy on the block from airport point of view in this, on this forum, what I see, and tell me if I'm wrong, it's very much been a, a stick-related activity. You will do this, or this is going to happen to you. Now, with all of the information we've got wrapped around us, we can turn that into, if this savings to be had, share it with the guys who created the savings okay let's start to incentivize people to the right behaviors that will then lead to lower costs and less maintenance and all that good stuff that goes with it so there's a, there, i think there's a bit of a culture thing that we can look at but the culture thing won't start until you've got that data absolutely nailed down and i think that's where we're going and yeah. I think I think uh, Paul, what we what we haven't touched on here is that uh, you know across the industry, and I saw a report in one of the GSE magazines a while ago, and I I think it runs into millions, if not higher, the cost of damage, you know, uh, GSE damage uh, on ramps all around the world, in all companies across this sector, is astronomical, and it's not me just saying this. This is this is this has been 
you know, reported in, 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 in many, many magazines. Interestingly, I was in uh, Dar es Salaam, one of our stations, um, back end of last year doing a transformation program with, with the GSE workshop there. And in the office was some loads and loads of magazines in the GSE workshop manager's office. And I pulled one magazine out and it was dated 1973. And it said, GSE safety, damage on the ramp, back to basics, 1973. Okay, so I know you roll on all these years later. GSC damage, I would suggest, is probably one of our biggest cost drivers in terms of in terms of fleet. Uh, but we need the telematics to move from anecdotal evidence to objective evidence. Mm -hmm. So and I've seen some great examples of Swissport. I saw a great example uh, in Amsterdam uh, beginning of the year where we've got some telematics fitted to the forklifts. So the senior manager was, was, was showing some basic telematics. Where is it? What's it doing? What speed is it going? What's it hit? Uh, you know, what shock activities is it detected? And uh, and literally within overnight, he said the behaviours change once people realise that you know they they, they you know, that when they've driven into a wall, um, um, that uh, they need to be more careful because we can see who's done it and then questions ask why have you done that? And um, we, we've got we've got a I, th I think for me that's one of our big selling points is reducing reducing the, the the damage to the fleet because that is is expensive you know if you look at the ratio of preventive maintenance to corrective maintenance I come from a background where the PM should constitute 70 percent of repair effort and the CM should be 30 percent I very often see it the wrong way around we're mm -hmm. We're conducting far more, far more, far too much corrective maintenance, and a big proportion of that is damage. So we need the telematics to help us, you know, identify that and, and start to drive those behaviours. But as you pointed out, I think either you or Chris said that it's not a big stick. It, it, we've, we've got to take a professional approach to change behaviour, and that, there, there lies the real challenge, the second real challenge, isn't it? I think. Yeah, and the 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 effectiveness of the system, and what you were saying, Paul, about how much information you can have and the data. And then something like John was mentioning about, you know, at ground level, there's too much what you should do, when you should do it, where you should do it, but there isn't enough explanation and communication about why you should do it. And if people understand and they can see the difference, they can see the benefit and they start to care, then people's attitudes and, and the culture and everything will start to change. And I, I've seen so much where people are, they're, they're still ignorant of why certain things are, are, are being expected of them. And it's that communication and how to communicate to make them really care. Because why should care suddenly stop when you close your door from home and then you act differently in the workplace than you would in your own in your own home? That's what baffles yeah. me so often. Yeah. Chris, I saw a great example in um, it was in one of our uh, some of our stations in the Middle East. The fleet manager was telling me that um, you know when the volumes dropped, um, a number of the staff were still around uh, the airport on the ramp. They put a program together um, to, uh, I wouldn't say refurbish the equipment, we're talking BTUs, CTUs, but to smart the equipment up. But yeah. the operators got involved in this and the operators were involved in, in, in cleaning and painting equipment, putting new Swissport logos on. And, um, uh, and I thought that, that was very in innovative. And, uh, and, and what came out of this, the fleet manager was telling me, was that um, operators were getting a pride in equipment. And if someone used that equipment, and damaged it, they were getting very upset. You've damaged a piece of equipment that I've, I've spent some time and effort to, to make it look smart. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's a sustainable activity going forward when we're at full demand, but it's the principle of what you're saying, isn't it? It's trying to build in that pride and that ownership and, and explaining yeah. people what's required. And going back to the data piece, once people realize that, you know, A, if you do do something that you perhaps should not be doing, we will detect it. But, but it's, it's, it's creating that culture change. And I think combination of what we're saying so far, this, this good planning, um, removing surplus equipment, managing it professionally, bringing in data-driven decision-making, underpinned with looking after the people and, and creating that culture of, I, I actually do care about this equipment. You know, I, easy things to say in a podcast, but this is, this is, this is, this is the journey. I think we all need to go on to, to do what, to, to achieve what you said is where, you know, that I was saying in Swissport, well, we've certainly got in fleet that every euro is a good euro going forward. Every two euros is even better, you know? Yeah. You know I mean? so, yeah. Yeah. 100%. yeah. yeah. I, I, agree. I, I would pick up on the point that Paul made as well about league tables. I, I've had very, very effective results from league tables. Um, again, when I first installed telemetry, telemetry, I used to put the cost of the damage on the wall 
Mm. And people would look at me and went, that's not right. I went, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, here's the data to prove it. And then it became a bit of a game because it, oh, I bet you can't get under that. Yeah, yeah we can, but you can't. And, and, it, and it just drives a different behavior. It was the same for fault reporting. The fault reporting for the, for the GSC and faults was, was, wasn't great. But it became a bit of a game where they used to challenge me. I've reported a fault and I used to be able to come back and go, yeah, I've already repaired it. Unlucky. You know, and it became a bit of a cat and mouse game, but they 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 they, they enjoyed it. it. It became a very not not a not a harsh stick nature. It became a fun yep. nature, a fun a fun environment where they got pleasure in trying to get to beat me in terms of oh, I've reported it. Well, I've fixed it too late. You know, so yeah, 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 um, yeah. It, it became it became very a very different um, very different environment in the crew room, and everybody. You know, everybody to a to a to a man and woman in that crew room. I used to walk in the results, and I used to hold them, and 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 they used to look at me and go, "Come on, how do we do? How do we do?" You know, it just yeah, joined yeah, yeah. The sense of behaviour. So I, you know, I would be able to go unlucky or well done, you know, and then you know the, the then general manager, if they if they did well, there would be some sort of reward for that. You know, there would be some sort of benefit. You know, simple things like pizzas in the crew room, or, or you know, just just the odd just the odd well done. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, it went a long way, and it drove a completely different behavioural pattern. Jump in on that yeah, one, and it's it, it's that care, and like I said, I use the acronym for care. As, you know, consider all responsibilities everywhere, and if people start to do that, whether it's through pizzas, whether it's through awareness equals effectiveness, or whatever, it, it makes that big difference. And then if it's got the three DM effect, you're able to back it up, and that's why you're able to focus. Now, listen, gents, we're coming near to the end of the podcast. What I'd like to ask you, okay, is and, and there's no rush, but I'd like to ask you three things that you would, could, or should do that would make things better for the entire supply chain and three things that you would like in return to make things better for your area of responsibility. Hmm. Who'd, like to, who'd like to jump into the deep end? And the definition of supply chain, you're not just talking material and spares, you're talking supply no. GSE. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm talking about yeah, everything, everything, everything that your good work affects, and then anything that those that are affected could do differently that could make things more either efficient or productive or beneficial from your side. I think the first one for me, uh, Gary, uh, is to pick up on OEM and manufacturer interaction in GSE. Yeah. I think they have a key part to play in this in terms of training material, providing us with the right, the right, uh, the right piece. We, we touched on it earlier about the car salesman and, and sitting in your car and this is the indicator. This is right. Well, you know, there is there needs to be a better line of technical training for our for our workshops and other workshops that support ground service equipment, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, that would that would be one key for me. And also operator training, you know, there's depending on the manufacturer. There are varying degrees of level and um, we, we have reached out to various manufacturers and some of them have been quite um, very responsive in terms. We did a very good piece uh, well, Steve did a very good piece with a, uh, with a piece of equipment on. We actually defined what we want from a training material and how that should be delivered, what, what it needed to contain. Uh, and that was very effective, but I do think you know, they have a role to play in this, in, in providing us with that expertise and engaging with us instead of lobbing it over the fence and looking over and go, how's it going? Uh, yeah. there, needs, there needs to be that interact, bit more interaction. And also I'd like to see, you know, a bit more involvement. We've reached, I think Steve would support me on this point where we've reached out to manufacturers and say, why don't you ask us what we, what goes back to that, what happens on the, what happens at the coal face? why don't you ask us what we actually want from a piece of equipment and think, instead of designing something that we think we want. Um, particularly, I would say, around aircraft avoidance systems. Uh, yeah, yeah. And things like that um, would, would, be my, would be my reach out to the industry uh, 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 and, and sort of peace. Um, you know, get us, get us involved at the early design stage or get people involved at the early design stage that are going to utilise this equipment. Um, and I think I think that would have significant benefit. So I'd, I'd say the manufacturer has a key role to play. Yeah, yeah. I think from my I think from my perspective, part of that professionalisation that John mentioned through life capability management is something we brought with us. Is getting people to understand, you know, from cradle to birth, you know, what happens, you know, particularly in in a, in a concept and design phase, involve us at the design phase. That's one part. I think prof professionalisation of the profession 
and I'm talking the fleet pr pr profession. And if I talk just purely now the maintenance activities, and I've, I, you know, I sit on the GSSE committee and we've done a lot of work in terms of HM chapter nine and the requirement for technical training, for example. And we've yeah. created a training matrix within in fleet within Swissport, which we're now aspiring to, 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 to deliver. And I think we need to build a, um, a build a, you know, almost a, a career pyramid for, 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 for people working in, in, in the fleet and the maintenance activity. So as John said to me many times, let's, let's make it attractive for people to come in to be an apprentice and maintain yep. equipment. Let's make it attractive to, to come in, be an apprentice and stay in the business and move onwards and upwards to become a very effective and well-skilled and and uh, and and recognised, uh, you know, team leader, supervisor, and workshop manager with the relevant qualifications. You know, I went through from city and guilds to INs to CNs to degree trained engineer to chartered engineer status, for example. Um, you know, in my career profile, I'm not suggesting for a moment we just overnight would be able to deliver that, but I think that would help to professionalise the organisation. And I think the third one is it was the whole purpose of this is an absolute recognition and turning that recognition into, into a reality that uh, telematics, is, it's not a new thing. It's just, I think the sector is probably behind the curve on this. Um, we, we need, it needs to be coming, you know, almost as a standard now, it's, it's very difficult to achieve because every manufacturer has its own systems, for example. There's so many different yeah, systems yeah. out there, but I think it, it's moving that agenda forward. So in the next three, four, five years, we're not talking about the need for telematics. We're talking about, telematics is working well what's the next challenge you know yeah yeah no, very good very good and um last but by no means least paul yeah i think for me it's we talked we touched on it throughout this uh this podcast it's, it's the getting over of the why why have for the operators why have we got telematics in this equipment you know and everybody around this virtual table the the operators at ground level management, the OEMs, the leasing providers, whatever, is this equipment is being put in for these reasons and it's for benefits for all. There's yeah. no one spying on anybody. There's no one trying to get anybody into trouble. And that is the piece for me, the biggest one of all is we need to work on that. We've, we've improved massively in, in the last few years on this, but there's still a heck of a long way to go. And I go out, to talk to ramp guys on a regular basis and and i get this oh we've got this telematics thing and it was always there trying to catch me out no it's not yeah, it's yeah, yeah. there to help you do your job more efficiently yeah yeah but no one explained that at the beginning right okay let's sit down with your team and let's do a little presentation what we're all about and once we've done that you get that significant improved buy-in and then you watch, we can actually physically see that so you'd see the logons to we can register who's gone onto the system to do what. Yeah. So we profile that at station X, it was Y percent usage. We go in there, we do a bit of a inward sell of what the benefits, and you can actually see the utilization of the system step change. Yeah. Then the key is, okay, it's a nice shiny toy for six weeks and it then withers off. How do you maintain that interest? We'll go back to the piece I said earlier that we're looking at now is you've got data flowing with information and actions. It's the follow-ups. Yeah. Okay. So we're moving. Telematics is here and here to stay. It's, it's the data and utilization going forward, I think, is the next biggest challenge is to the effective use of meaningful data. Yeah. But therein, therein lies the problem. And let me just ask you all just very quickly irrespective whether it's telematics, whether it's any other system, whether it's any other um, inf information guides, platform, etc., it's what people do with it, okay? So now, should we now be looking at the type of leadership training, okay? And how do we train people to lead more effectively? And how do we train people to understand that they need to be led so that people understand so many more of the whys at the grassroots levels and they can appreciate it more because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where you are in life, you report to someone and that someone reports to someone else. So we're all being led or managed, et cetera. But under these pressures now, it's how effectively it's done. And, and you know, I just feel there might be an opportunity to, to sort of change the way people are, are taught how to lead others, how to motivate others, how to tell them why, 
how to use systems better and realize that those systems are the, the makers or breakers of the business. So I, I just think there's a great opportunity now to do that if it's very effective, if it's done very quickly, and if people can see the benefits. What, so if I can, if I can just take, if I can take that from a Swiss port perspective, if you don't mind, John, uh, Chris, is yeah. that um, we have two programs for Swiss ports, active leadership and active supervision training. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, again, well, trying to swing the lamp too much. My background is, is, is ostensibly being leadership led. Um, I've seen those programs. I've been involved in those programs. So has John. They're good programs. They're fit for purpose. Um, and they, they, were, uh, they have been designed primarily for the ramp operators and fleet has sat on the margins for that. However, um, through the transformation program we're running at Swissport, it's now uh, uh, the profile of fleet has been raised significantly. The requirement to professionally train our people, both internally and externally, um, through a training policy which we've created has been uh, uh, endorsed at the highest level. It's now part yeah. of our glo global fleet management policies. Um, and the requirement, uh, I'm actively involved in this with the, with the designers of the leadership program, the requirement for a fleet uh, specific module um, has been built into or is being built into those training programs so that, yes, you can learn the, the fundamentals of leadership and supervision, but when there are specifics, particularly in the fleet world, you know, the use of data. Um, how to manage a workshop effectively and, and, and data management and use of, you know, Microsoft programs and uh, enterprise <coughs> management systems is, is critical. That has been uh, uh, been absolutely endorsed. And we've, we, that now reads across to the work we've done lobbying with Steve Savage and his team in IATA to, to build the technical training requirements into the IATA Chapter 9. You know, and uh, we were instrumental in helping to develop that policy, and and that will be part of an ISAGA audit going forward. And it certainly has raised and will raise the profile of this requirement to not only have qualified, competent, and current technicians. I note the word I say technicians, not mechanics. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. and uh, effective, competent, and current leaders uh, and supervisors. You know, uh, um, so I th I think. I think, you know, from, I can only talk from a Swiss world perspective, we're on that journey. There's quite a long way to go, um, but we're on that journey. And I think with the inclusion of the requirement in AR to Chapter 9, that's going to help to, to accelerate that, in my view. Okay, very good. And, John, can I just ask you a couple of things that we didn't actually touch on? Unmanned equipment and electric equipment. Yeah, um, the, the, autonomous, the autonomous piece. Is that yep. the, yeah, the autonomous piece? Um, I, it's coming without a shadow of a doubt. I think it's got a little way to go. I've seen some, and no doubt you all have seen various autonomous pieces of equipment being demonstrated at places like Munich. Um, the technology is again uh, coming thick and fast. And then I would therefore revert back to what Steve just talked about is the training. Yep. Because that's gonna be That's gonna be quite intensive to fix. Uh, and on your electric equipment, um, I, I picked up on your uh, your comment earlier, a piece about are our, our airports ready? Um, and, yeah. and I think depending on where you are, is that's open to debate debate to which which are particular airports you want to talk about. But but yes, I, I, I think you know we have a we we have a policy in Swiss that we are moving to electric equipment. We intend to move to electric equipment. <coughs> We have a number of assets around around the patch, which is which are uh, uh, electrically operated. But it, again, I would go back to that training piece. I mean, I stood on the I won't name the brand of the the the, the loader that was electric, but I stood on it and I looked at the systems that were intrinsically involved in it, and it was a plumber's nightmare. So it, you know, it was the all the regen systems in terms of batteries when beds go up yeah, and beds yeah. down to, to uh, regen them and put that energy back into the battery. Um, that that's all great technology, but you give that to one of our technicians today, he's just going to look at you and go, "Yeah, it's a loader." Um, yeah. you know, and, it, and it, it's intrinsic, but electric definitely has its place. We've had some massive successes around the. Um, the patch with electric equipment. We have a number of electric assets in places like Newcastle, Southampton, even in Gatwick, um, where we, we, we've switched to electric electric functions. So it's definitely coming. Uh, and there is definitely a cost benefit around the maintenance of that. Uh, and we are trying to, uh, in the terms of TCO, TCM, trying to capture that cost and understand again what it is. And, and again, go from su substantial evidence to concrete, you know, definitely. Yeah in terms of yes there's a massive benefit to this 
and then we go back to the point that we've all been making through this podcast that internally comes down to the help of telemetry so um you know we go back to the telemetry piece on how i can you know demonstrate and pull that data okay gents thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure um as always to listen to people who care so much it's uh it's it's very 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 positive and i think that's what people need now so well done thank you so much for joining us really appreciate it good luck with everything that you're doing and maybe the next time we speak we're, we'll have taken many 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 steps forward and please god after this damn crisis starts to subside somewhat in the next five or seven months you know people can get back uh, to doing things that they they love to do and a lot of people who've been displaced the sooner we can bring them back into the business the better so thoughts with them great really appreciate it lads thank you so much and chris from a swiss water perspective thanks for inviting myself and john um, to the call thank you yeah. and thanks paul yeah, yeah thank you for guys thank you, and the last message steve we should put out when well, if anybody's interested in shirts like these we can give them a very very strong recommendation if yeah, I absolutely. You need to explain the shirt. It's like a gingham shirt, I think they call it, don't they? That's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. there's a word not, not used that often these days. <laughs> okay. okay. And here's All right, let's take care. Cheers. Cheers.